we meet sharing we uh, we're gonna have the sound of the bell also just to kind of mark it so we can you know be aware of the sharing and we can let it sink in and so we are kind of fresh for the next sharing but also to train ourselves to bring our mind back it's kind of like a, a, a continual training in practice so it's we call it a bell of mindfulness and out on campus you also have the chime so that could be like a, a bell of mindfulness or even a red light can be a bell of mindfulness to ah oh, okay it's time to come back and just enjoy three breaths in breath and out breath allowing our breath to bring our body and mind together. Um, dear friends, can you hear me if I talk this loud? And so I said my name earlier is Jonathan, and um, I'm happy to take some time to talk about nourishing joy with uh, the practice of mindfulness, at least how I do it. Um, you might have your own ways, but I, I hope something I say might be helpful for each of you to maybe find a little more joy throughout the day. Um, from time to time, the question comes to me, I find my mind wondering how can how can I ever be happy when there's so much suffering and so much wrong in the world every once in a while that question just comes to me and I never really found an answer but I started asking another question and I will remember forever the day that this question came to me I was practicing walking meditation in the park that's next to my apartment, Amazon Park. And it wasn't a very nice day. It was drizzling a little bit, so I had to wear a coat. And I was walking, and I saw a father and a son outside, and he was the father was teaching the little boy how to ride a bike. And I saw um, a flock of blackbirds, crows, come in and land together, and then all of a sudden take off together. And I just thought, wow, I wonder how they do that. And then another question came to my mind, how can I not be happy when there's so much joy in the world? Because it's really, it's a fact of life that there is suffering and there is joy. And the one that's going to inform my life is going to be the one that I nourish. I can't wait for joy to come to me from the world. It's up to me to cultivate and to grow within myself. And so I find a good starting place for doing that is practicing just as Sister Quinn Yim was sharing. When I stop and when I calm my mind and I'm not looking to the future and I'm not looking, regretting the past or anything, I always find that joy is never very far away. While I was practicing walking meditation in the park, I was practicing stopping and calming my mind. And as soon as I did that, there's joy right there. I don't think that the future is a bad thing. I think there's happiness in the future, but I also think there's happiness right here and right now. This very moment for me is um, the coming together of many weeks and hours of planning and running around town and talking to maybe hundreds of different people, pressure, and it's all coming together right now. So just everybody being here together is already nourishing my joy to see all of that come alive. When I stop and when I calm my mind and I'm really present, 
I see the that life is so so miraculous. I can't explain how anything happens. It's so beyond my mind, and it just fills me with such wonder and curiosity and joy to be in the present moment and see this world just unfolding. But I do have a very busy mind. <laughs> many, many years before I came to the practice where I developed the habit of not being present. So I'd like to share a few ways that I've come up with to remind myself to be present. And one of the ways is walking meditation, sitting meditation. My favorite way though is um, I'm very fond of poetry and writing and um, so our teacher has given to us many different verses to remember throughout the day and also I really enjoy writing my own. And these verses I use with my in-breath so I can recite a line silently when I breathe in and recite a line silently when I breathe out. And there's one for anything that I can find myself doing throughout the day. So waking up in the morning, I find it's very helpful to breathe in and say, waking up this morning, I smile. Right away, just waking up is such a happy moment. Um, there are 24 brand new hours about to happen for me. And that's the next line in the verse. Waking up this morning, I smile. 24 brand new hours are before me. And when I bring my mind to that awareness, I have 24 hours to live. I feel the aspiration to live those 24 hours in the best way that I can. And so I make that vow in that moment. I vow to live each moment deeply and mindfully. So I breathe in, waking up this morning, I smile. Breathing out, 24 brand new hours are before me. I vow to live each moment deeply and mindfully and breathing out and to look at all beings with the eyes of compassion. And I remember verses like that all throughout the day. Um, even just walking around, I can walk and when I breathe in, I can remind myself that I'm breathing in fresh air. Um, I've been places where I don't get to breathe fresh air. And even right now, the air is a little bit smoky and hazy because there's so many forest fires. The air is not as fresh as I'm used to. But when I do get to breathe in fresh air, that nourishes my joy. And so I can breathe in as I'm walking and just remind myself, fresh air, fresh air. And as I'm breathing out, if the day is as beautiful as it is today, sunshine, sunshine. Or solid earth, or lovely rain, or strong legs, any number of things I can remember that just remind me to be happy because I have so many reasons to be happy. As I go deeper and deeper into that kind of practice, as I make it more of a habit, I really find that um, I'm arriving at a deeper level of contentment with life. Not just joy for having the things I need, but just knowing that life is all right. Um, I used to have not a very clear idea of what joy actually was. Um, I used to have fun by doing things that weren't wholesome for me or left me feeling empty. But I didn't know what else to do because I was just doing what my friends did. I was doing what TV said was fun. I was doing what I saw other people were doing. And I really had to get to know myself before I knew how to nourish my own joy. I had to learn how to stop and calm my mind and listen to what my heart was telling me. And my greatest joy now comes from living my life in a way that I know fits my values and my ideals. When I know that I'm on the path for living a simple life, creating community, brotherhood and sisterhood, growing my heart, protecting the earth. It took me a while to realize, oh, that's what I care about. <laughs> 
I spent so much of uh, being a teenager and a young adult not knowing really what I cared about. And I had to learn how to stop and breathe and look inside, find out what I care about. And bringing that into the world, living my life that way, is deeper than joy, it's happiness. And it all starts with just coming back to my breath, seeing what's available in this present moment, And as long as I have mindfulness of that, I'm not afraid of suffering anymore. I know that I suffer in life and everybody suffers in life and it comes and it goes. And I can hold suffering in one hand and joy in the other hand. And for the first time in my life, the two can exist within side of myself at the same time. There's no longer, happiness does not exclude suffering anymore. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I can, and that's what it means to be alive. That's, that's what it means to be a human. We suffer and we feel happiness. And so knowing that I have friends and family and a community to support me in nourishing my joy, who actually encourage me Go nourish your joy. Go do what's important to you. Being grounded in a community like that has been um, the greatest happiness of my life. So how many of you in this room have experienced your heart beating, like it's going to like explode out of your chest? <laughs> or your stomach, like a knot in your stomach, or butterflies in your stomach, or your palms sweating, or your mind kind of racing? Yeah. And then how many of you had had relationships or people in your life? where you're like, oh my God, this person just pisses me off. Can't believe it. And so you, <laughs> so you, you yell at them or make a cutting remark or maybe slam the door or throw something in your room. Or you've had somebody in your life where you're like, oh my God, that person is so hot. You're like, and so you get, you're thinking about them and you see them and your face gets all red and kind of hard time speaking to them. Or anxiety. You have uh, an exam and you didn't really prepare for it and you know that and so you show up and your mind is like blank. You're like, how do I access this information? So all of those experiences are strong emotions. And strong emotions are part of what is being human. Part of that is hardwired into us. We have a fight, flight, or freeze response. Okay, so it's natural. I remember learning um, if you catch on fire to stop, drop, and roll. And in my life, I have burned, burned with anger, burned with passion, burned with despair, burned with anxiety. And the mindfulness practice is stop, calm, and practice. And, you know, I do a lot of sitting meditation. I've done a lot of sitting meditation. And... You know, I've had the experience of sitting and a strong emotion comes up and I just have the intention, I'm not going to move. I'm just going to breathe. I've also had the experience in my life, though, of being in such despair that sitting, I was jumping out of my skin. Just jumping out of my skin. And mindfulness practice, these are tools. It's like a, having a toolkit. So we have these different practices and we put them in our toolkit. And then when a strong emotion comes up, 
we take something from the toolkit. So I would do walking meditation, and I would just, I'd go out, I'd walk down the street, I'd, you know, walk in the meditation hall, walk in the garden, walk in the park, and I would slow my steps down, and like Jonathan said, I would say something with each step. So I might say, calm, calm, release, release. Or sometimes when anxiety is really strong, I just say to myself, safe, I'm safe. Another practice that I did was mindfulness while washing the dishes because I had dishes to wash and I still have dishes to wash every day. And instead of thinking of like, oh, they're dirty or this is such a hassle, I have other things to do, I would just focus on it and I would feel the water on my hands and then I'd look at the plate and then part of my practice is I wipe both sides of the dish. So the front, and I turn it over and I wipe the back. And then when I rinse it off, I just put my hands on that plate so it's all smooth. So with mindfulness, your dishes will be really clean. <laughs> or I would do the practice of when I took a shower, I, again, I would come into my body and I would feel the heat, smell the soap, look at my body. It's interesting. Often, like, when I take a shower, I'm not even really looking at my body. I'm thinking of something else. And I don't even know how I got to washing my hair. It just happened. And mindfully washing my body, I would look at my hands or my arm and I'd just be like, this is like from my ancestors. Like I have done nothing to create this body. And some of us really look like our parents or an aunt or an uncle. So for me, it's my hands. Like I look at my hands and it's like, this is like my mother. This is all my aunts, you know? My grandmother too. We all have the same wrists. So that's very grounding. When I'm really anxious, it's hard to eat because my stomach is really tight and I don't really have an appetite. And mindful eating, I just, I have my food. And again, it's really a process of looking and feeling deeply. So I look at the food. And when I pause like that, the colors sort of enhance. Like I really see. Like I've had soup before and then I really look at the soup and it's very hot and there's still bubbles. And if I didn't have mindfulness, I would miss that. Taking the food and then pausing and putting my spoon or fork down between bites. And then it's easier to eat. Or I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I get really stressed out and so I overeat. I'm like, uh, six cookies all at once. Um, or like huge plate of spaghetti that is like hurting my stomach <laughs> as I'm finishing it. But I'm really uncomfortable, so I'm stuffing myself. And the mindful eating, putting that fork down, I don't eat too much. I don't eat to the point of discomfort. So that's really helpful. Before I was going to talk with y'all, um, my hands were sort of clammy, and my heart is was really beating really fast before talking with y'all. So I did a practice that I do when I'm walking: is I stop and I look at a flower, and it's called like lingering, lingering on a flower, and. It just cuts through for me. It's, I try when I'm out and about, when I see the flower and I take the time to look at it, I take three breaths or I take ten. Because it's, I don't know, it kind of pushes like my comfort level. You know, one's a little self-consciousness being out in public and staring at a flower. <laughs> but when I breathe 
10 breaths, looking at that flower, it just comes together. And it nourishes my happiness. So mindfulness can take care of the strong emotions when they arise, but it can also be preventative. Like before I reach that state, I can do walking meditation, I can do mindful eating, I can look at the flowers, I can breathe mindfully. You know, you can do one breath meditation throughout the day. Like you sit at the desk before you take your exam and just do one breath. Or somebody texts you, just one breath. It's great if we can carve out 20 minutes in a day to do sitting meditation, but sometimes we're just really busy. So just take one breath. And one breath over and over and over and over and over throughout a day, it's like a garland of pearls. It's just continuous practice. And that brings ease and happiness and joy and transformation in our life. So good midday everyone, it seems like we have a, a big buffet of uh, mindfulness practices already. We've been singing and we've been uh, having a guided meditation following our breathing and doing movements and also learning how to come back to our breath with the sound of the bell, how to find ways of nourishing our joy, what we really care about. And how to recognize and to befriend our strong emotions. So these are some of the, the mindfulness practices that we really want to offer because they're so practical and they can really be easily brought into our lives and just to make us feel more at home in our lives. Just make our body feel more relaxed and at ease so that our body can heal and be strong just by itself. It has an amazing intelligence if we just get out of the way. And when our mind can dwell with our body, we also feel aliveness and connection with life in a, in a way that is not available if we're running with our mind and we're tensing up our bodies. So I think we hear a lot about mindfulness and this mindfulness a little bit everywhere in society. And for me, it's like important to remember what mindfulness is. And mindfulness is always be mindful about something. So be mindful of our breathing. Be mindful of our loved one in front of us. And that mindfulness energy is to be aware of what's going on. And it also has the quality of not judging what is going on, but accepting it and just being with it as it is. So it has like aspects of friendliness in it, it has aspects of, of kindness in it. So it's not like uh, anyone going around, you're right, you're wrong, it's like not a judge running around. But it's a mindfulness energy, it's a, a calming, soothing energy already. So we want to invite that energy into our lives when we listen to the bell, for example. So that's kind of a way of training ourselves. So let's try it again. and. We just hear the sound, so we're mindful of the hearing, we're mindful of the sound, and just bringing our attention back to the sound of the bell and our natural breath. And whenever our mind might be wandering off, whether there's some thinking, there's some feeling, and we're away from the sound, just gently bring your attention and your awareness back to the sound of the bell.
So many times we call our practice uh, engaged practice. So meaning we want to practice our mindfulness into our lives and not just on the cushion. Being able to take five or ten minutes to just to sit, whether you're sitting upright on a cushion or in a chair, and just allowing yourself to come back to your breathing, following your in-breath and following your out-breath, letting go of all distractions. And whenever you're distracted, you recognize you're distracted, you gently bring it back. That can really help to create a core of, of mindfulness in us, to strengthen that energy in us. So when we do go out into the world, into our work, into our school, into our relationships, we have a, a stronger sense of awareness of what's going on. And we're not as easily triggered and taken away. Sometimes we talk about our thinking and feelings as clouds on the white, white clouds on a blue sky. So when we're recognizing when we're sitting, for example, that our mind is wandering. What could you see like, ah, there's a thought arising and it's like a white cloud passing by. But we can still just be with our breathing and see ourselves as a blue sky and there's clouds coming and going. But we don't have to identify with them. We don't have to follow them along. So we can be right here in our body, allowing our mind to dwell with our breath. It's kind of like our anchor. So if we're able to do that and find a way to generate that, it will help us a lot in our daily life. So that when we go through our daily life and we start getting really irritated or upset in a situation, it's easier for us to remember, ah, I know what is going on right now. I feel really frustrated in this situation. And I think it's like Mia was sharing, it's like we have these emotions, so it's not like we want to uh, fight them. But recognizing in the situations in our life when we allow frustration, irritation, and criticism take over, mostly it just gets worse and worse and worse, and then it's like we don't, we're fed up, right? So before we get to that point, before we get to the point of a sad thought becoming a depression, can we recognize it and letting it pass? Just recognizing as it is, not being afraid of it, but also not holding on to it or fighting it. But just recognizing, ah, it's a sad feeling. Breathing in, I know I have a sad feeling. Breathing out, I let it go. For me, when I go into the world and into my life, I feel like there's a certain situation that is more difficult to stay grounded and stay at ease. And I recognize like transition times can be one of those times. Whether I'm walking out of my room to the office, whether I'm walking out of the office to go to lunch, or whether I'm getting ready to go to an event like this and it's time to load the car. Um, so there's a couple of practices we can do when we're recognizing that situations in our life that might set us up for sadness, that might set us up for frustration, or whatever. So when I'm transitioning from one place to the next, many times at the monastery too, we take off and on our shoes. That is a great way of like, okay, so I'm taking off my shoes and I'm putting them neatly, so I know what I'm doing. So I'm not already at the meeting that I'm going to, right? But I'm putting my shoes on the ground or turning the knob of the door really being there and like feeling it you can also in that moment like being all like wow there's a door and there's a house and how does all those conditions come together so instead of it's just like something everyday normal life you you go in and you go through the door and they have these all these things that we take for granted having a door to open and a classroom to go to, or an office to go to. That's a great happiness already. So when we're opening the door, instead of feeling like it's like rushing somewhere, can we be aware we're opening the door and it's a great opportunity for us to have a door to open and this place to go to, a space to be. But also like, Jonathan was mentioning what are the things we care about in a bigger picture. So many times when we feel the most happy is actually when we care about others and when we look after others and make sure that they're happy. So it's not just 
me, me, I'm going to take my time to meditate, I'm going to, I need this, I need that. We need some moments to come back to ourselves, to let go and not have any like burdens or like any responsibilities, sure. But if we're able to, when we go out into the world, also seeing how can I help the people in my class? How can we share in a way that all our results will go up? How can I feel like sharing what I have instead of just trying to get something more? And in terms of the bigger picture of the world, being aware of the suffering in the world, being aware of the change in our environment, are we aware of that on a daily basis? Sometimes there's big sufferings in the world. We're aware of them, but it's kind of too painful to touch. We, maybe we get it through the news, but we don't really feel it. We don't really experience it, yet, because it's just too painful. There's too many other things inside of us that oh, we kind of feel it, and with, just have the idea that it's terrible and someone should do something about it. Or we have a reaction. But how can we come back to touch the suffering inside ourselves and to bring the soothing energy of mindfulness to help it settle down and just be aware of it, not reacting to it and just letting it be there. And little by little it can settle or little by little the wind will take it away. And when we're able to take care of our own personal suffering, we also be able to be more uh, there for other people. Sometimes we say it's easy to love other people, but I cannot love myself. It's not true. We cannot truly be there and love someone else if we're not loving ourselves. It's an idea we have. Well, I can help other people. I'm so generous. I'm so kind. But many times it's just we're fearful of pain. We're afraid of someone having a bad time and we cannot just be with them. We don't know how to alleviate their pain. We don't know how to alleviate their sadness. And we do something, we give them something, we say something, but we're just, we're just reacting from our suffering, from our not being able to be at peace with the situation as it is. And we think that is love. So when we come back to our breathing, when we come back to our footsteps, when we bring our mind back to our body, it's really a, an expression of love for ourselves. That we're taking the time to breathe in and breathe out, so our body, our cells in the body have enough oxygen to grow and to continue to be healthy and well. We're learning how to take care of our emotions without having to react to them, without running away from them, like eating ice cream because it's like something ooh, uncomfortable inside. And sometimes we become aware that we're eating ice cream and we feel not really good. So when we do it, instead maybe we cannot just come back and sit and breathe with whatever is going on, but we can eat our ice cream mindfully. So we can really enjoy it, right? So whenever we become aware that we're just wandering off, that is a moment when we're aware again. We're remembering, we're mindful of what's going on. So if we're mindful that we feel really upset and we're eating ice cream, we know we're eating ice cream. And that already has, gives us a chance to take care of ourselves, just where we're at. We don't try to be like all peaceful and happy all the time, but we have to recognize where we're at. And that is a way of loving ourselves taking care of ourselves and then what we can be there and how we can express our love for others will be much deeper and much more nourishing for other people around us. So our own practice and engaging in the world, in our relationships, it really goes together. So to keep reminding us, we put together this booklet it was put together mostly last fall when the, there was the first wake-up tour in the U.S. on the northeast coast. So please bring it with you. We're going to use it more during the day too to uh, read some of the practices we've been sharing about. And there's also some, some gatha, some verses that Jonathan was sharing about and some of the songs. And it can really be like a way of continuing to practice and to get nourished, get that nourishment of what what is life really about? What's important in life? And how do I take care of myself? So we also get that, that know-how 
we get input. We have a chance to like read and reflect about it. So we've talked a little bit about the stopping and calming. And it's also another aspect of mindfulness meditation practice that is looking deeply. Looking deeply into our life. What is the direction of our life? Where are we putting our energy? And is that, is that we feel like excited and happy and content about that? And then we'll have a lot of energy to put behind it, whatever we're engaging in. Or do I feel like I'm supposed to, or, you know, it's just like a habit energy of society, or a wish of my parents, or wherever it might be, to just look deeply into it. What are the things motivating me to act the way I do in my life? And small things like turning on the television when we come back home because we're tired and we need to kind of relax and chill out. Or if it's like what kind of profession we're engaging in. What is the kind of housing situation we're choosing to be in. Knowing that the situation physically like that we're in, it has a big effect on us. The people we interact with on a daily basis have a lot of impact on how we'll experience our life. So this booklet is kind of like a little droplet of... Uh, nectar into all our lives. So I'd like to end the sharing by, by making use of it through singing a song together. So if we can uh, open it up uh, and we can sing number 13. It's a no discrimination song. It's uh, very easy. So you see some lines, it goes two times and it also has some movements to it. So if you know it already, please sing along with me. And if you don't know it yet, it will be very easy to pick up the, the, the words and the melody. The sun, it shines on everyone. The sun, it shines on everyone. No discrimination, no discrimination. The rain, it falls on everyone. The rain, it falls on everyone. No discrimination, no discrimination. My heart belongs to everyone. My heart belongs to everyone. No discrimination, no discrimination. I sing this song for everyone. We sing this song for everyone. No discrimination, no discrimination. Any more verses? The children at Deer Park. My food belongs to everyone. My food belongs to everyone. No discrimination. No discrimination. The children at Deer Park, they taught us uh, one verse, maybe we can sing together. My socks belong to everyone. My socks belong to everyone. No discrimination. No discrimination. Ooh. Mm -hmm.